Okay, so uh, uh, we're going to um, today be talking about, um, and I'm not sure why this is not loading and refreshing properly. Give me a, just a second to get this up here again um, in Adobe Acrobat. So uh, today we're going to be talking about um, uh, finishing up the best practices. And there's just a little bit I wanted to, to hit on more with uh, a topic we, we, we briefly um, discussed last time, which is continuous integration. And I argued that continuous integration was valuable to avoid the Big Bang scenario, the scenario where you've got a lot of components integrating together and they don't play nicely together and you don't discover it until you know, late in the game um, because they're only being integrated once a month instead of once a day. With continuous integration, basically on a daily basis, you're expecting people to refresh from the code base. And when people check into that code base, there's a build that takes place. Um, and uh, in this day and age of continuous integration, it's every time they check in, uh, at the least it's uh, once a day in the old form of daily builds, which have been best practice in software since the 1980s. Um, now, uh, many advantages that I noted from this, quicker identification of problems, you get cooperation, you can identify the state of the, prog uh, the project and its progress, um, and you can get feedback from, from testers more frequently, et cetera. Um, the important component of this that you will need, uh, this is something I fully expect, and I'm going to go back and turn the, turn the lights on up front, is the... Um, the presence of a one-step build. What do I mean by one-step build? Does anyone want to comment on that? Well, you need a single trigger for a whole set of processes that are going to take place at, at build time. Um, these will include cleaning of the system. What do I mean by clean here? In the context of a build, to clean it out, what do I mean? Talk about building it from scratch. Why build from scratch? Why not build incrementally on top of the last build? Make sure that previous uh, builds still work, or the previous tests still work. Yeah, it turns out that when you build incrementally, there are cases where, so in other words, if you have a build before, and all you do is you build new modules that get checked in. It turns out you can miss certain incompatibilities um, that if you build from <coughs> scratch, you will in fact catch. And you wouldn't think it would happen as much as it does. Um, but sometimes build scripts are incomplete. People check things in by putting them directly in the server instead of going through an approved mechanism. And it may not be caught. So you do a clean, complete clean. So we clean away all .o files or what have you. You compile the source code, and note that this is often what people think about, particularly people of, of your sort of, um, uh, your point in, in the uh, study, is you know you think about compilation as the build. Compilation is not all of the build. There's a lot more to building than compilation. Um, uh, there's often recreation of the database or, um, or repopulation of the database. Um, that's being used for test servers, et cetera. Um, tests run based on that database. And then sometimes inspections of code run. And uh, as part of this test, a key one is the smoke test, right? That will ba basically check sanity of the software. And finally, if things have gone well, you will deploy that software, deploy it to test servers and so on. And you're gonna want you know, a, a good system to maintain this, whether it's Gradle or Ant, Maven, what have you, you're going to want a system that allows you to specify a, a rich set of, of steps and dependencies between them that can involve multiple components here. Um, this is an example on Ant, for example. But, um, uh, you know, some of the other systems I mentioned, like Maven, have, have a, a higher level of uh, view of things. Um, I don't want to go into this um, in great detail because we have a lot to discuss on the requirement side. But um, I did ma mention that maintaining the build is a big job. Why is it a big job? Why does maintaining the build take a lot of a person's time? 
Why is it sometimes a full time job in some some companies for, for some projects? Some money needs to be deployed to different devices. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, a lot of device issues and so on. Okay. Um, so there might be, you know, iPhone and, and uh, Android devices, Blackberries, uh, Windows Phone, and you've got you've got to get the build machinery in place for the appropriate code bases to target each of those machines. Okay, that's that's good. I like that. Who was that? Uh, Nobleman. Uh, Nobleman. Nobleman. Yes. Thanks, Nobleman. Um, uh, other um, other reasons maintaining the build might be a big uh, big challenge. What has to happen over time as the code base grows? Um, uh, things need to uh, things need to expand on the code base. Um, the code base has more and more features in it. What does that need? What do you need to modify in the build to take that into account? It has to test all the new features. Yeah, it has to test the new features. And so the smoke test in particular is going to have to grow. Just check sanity, right? There's going to be more features to basically test. And also the set of tests associated with uh, system tests, uh, integration tests, um, um, acceptance tests, maybe uh, will be growing as well. Um, there's also more modules associated with it. So actually maintaining the stuff there is, is, a, is a sizable job. And sometimes there's configuration needed, installing things. You know, you need need to compile this in this domain specific language. You need to work with that. Um, uh, using this other tool, and you know, putting in place the scripts to do that is is not uh, trivial. Okay, um, so maintaining the smoke test um, and uh, and using that um, uh, to to guarantee sanity of the code base, uh, it requires uh, quite a bit of effort sometimes. Um, I mentioned the smoke test, basically checking sanity to identify stability of the system. It's not so much to discover where particular bugs are, um, but to discover whether there's such stability issues that the build should not be pushed to developers. Remember, a, bro a build that is broken um, is, can be really problematic if it's pointed to developers because they can't, they can't actually do their testing. They can't do what they're developing nearly as much. So, you know, a broken daily build should be, or continuous integration should be the exception, not the rule. Now, uh, a number of the systems that I mentioned, I'll put their names up again, um, things like um, uh, Apache Continuum um, uh, or uh, Jenkins and Hudson, I believe, um, uh, they will actively, they provide the mechanism to send notifications to the team when the build is broken. Why might a build be broken? Give me a couple of reasons a build might break. Someone's broken the bill. Why, why is that? Give me a couple concrete scenarios that might lead to the bill breaking. It doesn't compile. Doesn't compile. Great. The system they ran on is different from the one that's. Great. So they were assuming a certain dot h file availability of a certain jar, and that's not present on the system on the build the build system. What's another reason? Your imports were messed up somewhere along the line, or they were out of order. Your inputs. Oh, imports, yeah, exactly. So, so um, maybe, maybe there was a merge of code when you checked your code in. Um, there was a recent other check-in, they had to be merged, and uh, there was some sort of issue uh, with the, the ordering of the imports that made, uh, made a, you know, introduced a, a problem or, or led to some duplication in namespaces, clashing in namespaces. Uh, okay, um, so that's a possibility. Other things? Import or, or pound pound include, sir. Other things? Other merge conflicts like that? Yeah, merge conflicts can introduce uh, problems. Um, uh, again, double double naming of things or, or functions you're expecting that were accidentally left out or what have you. So good. Um, other things besides compilers, though, that can break the build. Okay, uh, okay, not thorough enough testing, uh, that's true. That, and that could lead to what, in concrete terms, to what failing? Okay, runtime error that might inhibit, 
It might be so basic that people can't log into the system, can't achieve basic functionality. In short, can't test their own new features. They're off there, you know, using their own laptops, they refresh in the build, and suddenly they can't even test their own features because they can't, they can't get basic authentication on the system anymore. They're, they're, they don't have the permissions to do certain things or whatever. Okay. So, so that's uh, certainly the case. You can even have code that refers to database tables that don't exist on the build server, that only exist in your private server, right? So you're developing on your laptop, you have a private database, you remember to change, the, you add something to the schema there, you add a few fields, your code refers to it, um, you check your code and you forget to update the schema on the server, and so now your code running as part of the smoke test perhaps um, doesn't work, right? It, it's referring to tables in the schema that don't, don't work. Um, can you imagine that? Yeah, I mean, so it's a lot more, ladies and gentlemen, than just code files. I mean, code files are a lot of where it's at, but there's a lot of other things besides that. There's consistency of the database schema between what the developer expects and what's actually on that server. There's the presence of other files needed for the system to run, maybe configuration files. Um, there's uh, issues having to do with permissions, um, permissions being set on the server being different than on a user's local machine. Lots of things can go wrong when you, build the, uh, break, uh, when you get things up to the build in a way that breaks the build, okay? Um, now, breaking the build is a very serious thing because it prevents the team from getting the latest changes and if it's not caught early, it prevents the team from getting work done because they've gotten broken code. They've refreshed themselves with broken code and they have to roll back and at least it's awkward, okay? So you really got to avoid uh, breaking the build and there's a lot of opprobrium against that in many teams. In your team, I do expect build status to be monitored and I would want to see the ability to see, for me to see by going to a website, for example, is the build working? Is it broken? What's the latest build status? I want to be able to see that, and your team should be able to see it. And at least some people on your team, probably all, should get notifications if the build breaks. What do you think happens if the build breaks? Okay, so someone checks something in. I check something in, it's late at night, and I'm tired, it compiles and builds just fine in my, my system. I run the smoke test on my laptop in my little sandbox. It works fine. My unit tests work fine. I check it in. It breaks the build. Maybe, maybe someone checked in things just after, just before I did. So, I, you know, I refreshed, I went through and I, I ran the tests and I made sure things are fine. Meanwhile, someone else has checked in and then I go to check in, and their, their code conflicts with mine. And then I go to sleep, what happens? So it breaks the build, the build doesn't work. What, what should happen? It should be rejected. Should be rejected. It should be ideally not included in the Git or Subversion repository, it should be rolled back. And often it requires the build master to do that. But often I, because I did the check-in, am involved in rolling it back too. I know what I checked in, all the details. So, um, you know, it's important that that build master be notified soon. Ideally, if the build fails, it should roll back the latest check-in to the last sane state where the build worked fine. And it should notify people, basically your check-in was rejected, your commit, right? Your git push, whatever was rejected from the system so that I can fix whatever's wrong. And it could be innocent, you know, again, there's a race condition. You checked it in just after I refreshed, but before I checked in and there was a conflict. That can break builds too. Um, uh, so, so, you know, builds uh, are central, getting in place a continuous integration server is a key part of this course, and I would uh, expect it. And, you know, um, notification mechanisms will vary by project, but at the least you want to have email sent out, maybe text messages, etc. A um, couple principles, this is from uh, Duval's um, good coverage of them. Um, you know, commit code frequently. Um, it recommends committing at least once a day. Now that's, that's um, ambitious, it's not always required in projects. 
What you definitely want to do is you want to refresh your code base once a day to get the latest changes from other people. Because you don't want to be, you know, spending a week work on your project, not refreshing your code base, and suddenly at the end, when you refresh your code base, you find lots of errors because of all the work everyone else has done in the meantime. Does that make sense? Could you imagine how that happens? Hello? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, you know, very, very easily done. Committing code frequently rather than in big chunks is also advisable. Daily is is um, is uh, a lot, but uh, particularly for students who are juggling several classes. But do do it frequently. Don't hold off for two weeks with some code. Believe me, it happens in, in these classes, and it can cause major problems because they're using old. Often they haven't refreshed a lot during that time, and they're using old versions of other people's stuff or what have you. Don't commit broken code, right? If it doesn't compile on your system, don't check it out. If it doesn't run the smoke test on your system, if it doesn't pass a basic test, don't check it out. You will, you will, you know, really screw over other people if you if you do that. If you have a broken build, go to fix it immediately. You know, a um, developer committed the code typically involved in, in, in fixing it. Right, developer tests. You don't want to depend on manual testing. Each year in this class, it seems like get people saying, well, we're going to put a real emphasis on manual testing because we've got an X app. And you can fill in X. Maybe it's a, you know, a mobile app that has to run on multiple platforms. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a web app. Um, maybe it's a multi-platform app. And they say, we don't know how to test that. They say we're going to depend mostly on manual testing. Um, manual testing is great. It can be exploratory. You can trace down issues. You can notice slowness and usability issues. Lots of good things about manual testing, but you need and I will require automated tests for at least some of your tests. The smoke test must be automated. <coughs> you don't have the luxury of you know, having someone in a cage who every time you check in has to do the test. That's not the way things work. You need automated tests. And if you are using technologies um, that you're not quite sure what the test hooks will look like, how to test this technology, you need to start researching that immediately. Um, you know, so if you're doing a JavaScript-based application, you need to figure out how JavaScript testing works. Believe me, there's lots of stuff on that. Um, if you're using, um, you're using Go, on the uh, server side, as your server side, um, major server side language, you need to find out what test harnesses are like in Go. Um, if you can't use JUnit directly, figure out what you can use. Um, uh, desktop Java apps, there's testing systems that will pound them through their user interface. Uh, you will also want to write programmatic tests that call things uh, from test harnesses. So you want to figure out soon what your test infrastructure is going to be. And I'm going to ask about that next week on the infrastructure presentation. I'm going to ask, OK, what are your testing plans? How are you going to carry out the testing? How are you going to perform mocking? How are you going to, how are you going to create you know, fake versions of pieces of your system so that you can decouple elements of it? You're going to be wanting to think about that. Test some inspections have to pass. Run private builds. You should be doing builds locally, no just manual comp compilation, do local builds and, and make sure that you know, tests run in an automated fashion. Okay? Um, and avoid getting broken code. If the build has failed, don't refresh from it. Wait for, unless it's automatically re rolling back, wait until it's fixed. Because if you refresh from a broken build before it's been rolled back, you're going to hurt because you might not be able to test your code. Okay, um, uh, you know a lot of things here on on testing because um, uh, you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to test uh, automated ways so the build can include a lot of tests. Does a build include all tests? Do you think that have ever been written? Turns out builds in large projects do not. There's important classes of tests that they do not include. Often they don't do all unit testing, and often they don't do all regression testing. Because in a large project, in a long maintained project, 
you may have thousands or tens of thousands of regression tests, for example, and tests associated with unit level. And you don't have time to do that every continuous integration build. Instead, you might do it daily or you know, a few times a week um, rather than every time you check in. Um, but you will want uh, probably some system-wide tests uh, running. Um, and, uh, and you're going to want to make these uh, repeatable. So, so you want to have the database rolled back to a known state. Um, okay, database integration. This comes up quite a bit, uh, again, from Duval in, um, in, in uh, builds. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you need to get beyond thinking about Git and Subversion as a, as a place just for code. Um, if, if any of you were stuck with that idea, um, you have to broaden your mind to realize that uh, Git and Subversion and other version control systems can contain lots of other things besides code. Give me an example of something else they might contain related to a database. Beyond the source code of your application. Okay, good. Resources. So it might be uh, images, right? Um, images for splash screen or images for buttons or, or whatever. So, so I like that a lot. How about other things that might be in there? Your readme. Uh, yeah, readme files. Excellent. Good. Absolutely. Others? Any other documentation that you might have? Requirements docs. Good. Good requirements docs. They, they, they like code. They evolve. So why not have them in there? Other things? You may have them in another version, versioning system on Google Docs or something, which allows you to roll back. That's also acceptable. The point is functionality um, in terms of being able to, to get, them, uh, get them rolled back. But at least you could think about putting them in that source code repository as an alternative. Other things? Build files. Build files, yeah, um, in a big way, because they need to evolve as the app application acquires more files, right? Config files for the app. If you have a, if you have a inversion of control type of situation where you have config files for your application that it needs to run, um, they they will be in there because they will evolve with the application. You need to use the uh, the version of an application with the corresponding version of that config file for it to work happily. Um, database schemas, ladies and gentlemen. What do you mean by database schema? How many people have taken three fifty five here? Okay, what do I mean by database schema? The tables and attributes and everything. Yeah, tables and attributes. Do you think that might evolve with an application? Absolutely, in a big way. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't assume, oh, you know, we'll roll back our code base and things will be hunky-dory. Well, if you're using the latest version of the database and that old code base required a different structure of the database, it might not work at all, right? So you're gonna wanna be able to roll back say, structure the database to an earlier version to see if a bug existed there. Um, you're also going to want to make sure that developers who are out there can go refresh against that latest schema, right? So that they can create that schema on their own database and their own sandbox, right? Does that make sense? They need to be able to work with the new version of the application, so they need to be able to, if they have a local database on their machine to develop against, a local sandbox database, they need to be able to recreate the schema for them, right? Other things, test data. Data that goes into that database that's used in testing. You know, so you can do a query against this and see if the, the results are correct, et cetera, right? So you use a version control repository to share database access. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, need, you need to have someone in the development team often who will be thinking about maintaining maintaining this, um, this database uh, structure over time if, if it's a, uh, a big part of, of the application. And most applications built in this class and most applications built out there in the world have some sort of database. It may be an embedded database, maybe a database on a server. So, you know, embedded database might be H2 or Derby or those sort of databases, SQLite. Databases out there on servers might be you know, Postgres, MySQL, and Industry, uh, Oracle, um, Sybase, what have you. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, right. I want to talk about this directed triage thing. This is going to be a big, um, 
big part of it. So I was asked earlier, remind me your name? Kyle. Kyle, yes. Um, so Kyle asked, you know, what's expected for ID1, for example, right? Um, and in general, as you get close to these deliverables, whether it's for me or out there for stakeholders um, that are working with you um, or after you graduate in the world, um, there's going to be a, a, a process that's needed as you approach deliverable, delivery to figure out what goes in the system and what goes out. So you may have decided three weeks ago, as part of the start of your scrum, the start, start of, this, uh, of this sprint, you know, for three weeks, you decided um, on a certain set of features. And maybe someone's gotten sick, maybe certain things have taken longer than expected, certain technologies haven't worked out so well, um, class schedule has been very heavy, and so you haven't gotten all those features in place. You've got some features half built, half completed. And you know that Osgood wants solid features. If, if it's not solid, you know, it shouldn't be in there um, for these uh, deliverables. And you don't want your stakeholder to be throbbing buttons on your app at every crash. You, you, want, you want it to be quite solid when you go in front of them. So there's this process called directed triage that basically its job in life is to figure out where we're at in terms of bugs. It's to, particularly to get the project managers um, to, to have a sense about, okay, how severe are the bugs? Where are those bugs living? Um, and you know, how many independent ones of those? And that's, this means wading through bug reports to prioritize bugs and figuring out how many bug reports are really serious and how many you know, are, are more minor things. It's basically about them gathering information um, and reducing uncertainty on their part about where we're at. Do we have any serious priority one bugs um, that like crash the system or cause data loss? Um, lead the uh, lead the system to actually um, fail to work at all, maybe persistently wedge it. Um, if so, you know the project manager needs to know about those things. But when you have you know a uh, hundred bug reports in the repository, it's hard to know how many of them are distinct, how many of them are uh, outdated, uh, how many of them are high priority, low priority. And so directed triage involves going through and figure out what to. What to you know? What's what? So you can reduce your uncertainty. And then there's a, a separate triage process that is used to determine okay which of these actually get fixed and which which um, get uh, pushed off um, before the deliverable. So some deliverables they just chop a feature because the feature is there, the code is in the system, but they don't expose it, so I can't click on it. Right? Stakeholder can't see it. So the code's there, but it's not being exercised. It's too buggy. Or the code gets totally removed. Um, but there may be features, there may be bugs you leave in the system. Why would you leave a bug in the system? There's a bug, it's a known bug, but you decide to leave it in. It's not worth fixing. Okay, um, not worth fixing. Maybe it's a minor bug. Um, uh, could be. Um, Rare, okay, another good good reason. That would lead it to be often considered low priority if either of those were the case. Give me another reason though. Why it actually might not be super rare, but but why you might leave it in. More of a feature than a bug. Right. Um, <laughs> wow, isn't that cool? Um or at the very least can be passed off as a feature somehow. Oh, oh, okay. Um from my experience, um um, we as software engineers are more charitable of viewing something as a feature than a user <laughs> is. Um, often they don't share our sense of, look how wedged the machine gets with this. You know, isn't that, have you ever seen it get so wedged before? Um, okay, uh, what's, what's another reason you might leave it in though? Maybe there's a new feature on the way that will solve this problem. Okay, so this is a very temporary blemish and we could tell the stakeholder, look, this is not working properly, but you know, starting next week, we're expecting to get something which which will get rid of this. It's going to be a total overhaul, and this will be pushed in the background. So that's one good reason from Bert. How about another? 
could it be fixing it would have caused the entire thing to break? That is, is a big issue that I'm looking for. Um, or, let, let's put it, uh, Mahmoud? Yeah. yeah. Um, it could be that you think that it's just too delicate and actually fixing it will likely break other things. Or it could just be there's a risk of that. That, you know, there's, there's a significant risk that if we try to fix this, that we may destabilize the whole thing. And often the issue is this, mark my words. Often this is late in the game. You've got this deliverable tomorrow. You've got a demo it here in class for me. And you've got this bug. You'd like to fix it, but what you're afraid is if you fix it, it may destabilize something, and you don't have time to do a full set of testing to discover that. And you're gonna come up here in front of me, and you're gonna be demoing it, and it's gonna, it's gonna be embarrassing. It's gonna crash. It's gonna you know, do a core dump. Um, it, you know, or I'll say, oh, what happens if you press that button? And, uh, and bad things will happen with a capital B. Um, so the point is that often late in the game, it's not merely that we know that it's gonna cause problems. It's that it could cause problems and we don't have time. We don't have the luxury of testing it a lot. We don't have the luxury of really seeing is this gonna fix the problem or not. And you're playing Russian roulette. Do you feel lucky today? That's the question. And often it may be safer to just say, we're gonna leave it in there, it's gonna be a known bug. And I will tell you this, mark my words, if you have known bugs within your systems, notify me of that. I, I view that as an asset. You, you know, you've warned me this thing is unstable or flaky, and say what you're gonna do about it, but, you know, for next milestone or what have you, but let me know that you know about it. That's better than a bug you don't know about, right? Um, you can always suggest workarounds, et cetera. Um, you can choose demos that artfully avoid it. Um, okay, so in terms of what's expected from you, I do want one-step builds that run frequently from a clean slate upon check-in, and um, I say ant use, but um, really any of Maven, Gradle, um, uh, ant are, would be fine in other systems for, um, for other programming languages, et cetera. Um, I do expect near daily refreshes from you folks. Don't wait uh, you know, once a week to refresh your code base. Um, and before you check in, test against that refresh code base. Test against that code you've gotten down from Git or from Subversion from other people before you check in. Why? Why not just check your code in against, you know, without, without refreshing? You could break it. Yeah, you could break it because it's counting on features of other people's code that are no longer there, right? Among other things. It's made count on a file that's been merged with another one that's gone now, right? Um, I do expect posted and monitored build status. Um, different debug and release versions. This is good. Um, I don't know that, that it's that it's strongly expected, but it's a good thing. Why might you have different debug and release versions? This very morning, in this very room, I stood here in front of several of you, and I talked about something. In fact, it's right um, here, uh, which is removed from code before we ship it, before we give it to customers, before we give it to stakeholders. And what are those things? Assertions. Assertions. So assertions might be the debug version. They spot issues as soon as possible during testing, but not in release, for example. Um, I want to see a smoke test, and it should be evolving and automated. It should not be a human responsible. It really eliminates the purpose of it if it's a person. Um, uh, and I want to see the smoke test results as part of the build status, incorporating build status. And you know, some accountability for someone who builds the breaks the build, this should be um, called accountable. So, you know, people have been interested in what systems out there. For continuous integration, um, people have had good luck with many of these systems on the left-hand side. Jenkins, Hudson are two sort of branches of the same project, Cruise Control, Team City. I think Travis CI has been used by maybe one team, it's certainly used in industry. Uh, issue tracking, the department has track, but JIRA and Redmine are two very popular tools. 
for tracking. Um, and in past years, some folks have used Assembly as well. Um, issue tracking being used to track things like bug reports, feature requests, et cetera. Okay, any question on this? Okay, um, just a few more things and we will go on then to, uh, to some discussion of requirements. So, um, binary mini milestones. Um, okay, this is, this is really important. Um, you should be monitoring, project manager as well as uh, risk uh, officer should be, man uh, should be monitoring what's going on. What, you know, what sort of defect counts do we see um, um, in terms of uh, mini milestones, specific tasks which are completed. When I say completed, I mean completed. So that includes things, well, we'll go into exactly what it means, but it's not just the code is, is created. It's, it's gone through testing, it's been, um, uh, it's been not only implemented, it's been united smoke tested, release notes for it are updated, any documentation. Uh, often it's undergone peer review, at least in an informal way, peer desk check, someone's looked it over besides yourself. Um, it's been checked in and you know it's it's ready for testing on the um, on the server by the testing team um you want to be clear in your team what it means for something to be complete there's a lot of weasel words about this and you'll find it very easy to fall into the trap someone says are you done with that yeah it's done and then you inquire more well um okay i haven't written the test for it yet or you know it's it's done, but I write it, gotta write the documentation. Or it's done, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean it compiles. I don't know if it works yet. Um, very common, and it's a human, you know, it's, it's an aspect of human optimism that we, 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 we often will attribute completeness to something that's just, it, it's far, far short of it. So you want in your teams to be quite clear about what it means for it to be checked off. Viewing it as a task, you want to consider as a binary, is it complete or is it not yet complete? And I would suggest all these things. You know, If it's complete but it's not yet checked in, if it's been peer reviewed and all these things but it's not yet checked in, if it hasn't been peer reviewed, is that, is that complete? If it hasn't been smoke tested and unit tested, I wouldn't view it as complete. So you want to, you want to be clear within your team about what the standards are. And you can choose your own terminology. If you don't want to include check-in, you want to call that something else besides it's complete, that's up to you. It's just that you want to be clear when someone says it's complete, make sure you know what that means. Because it can be very easy to be the project manager, you briefly talk with someone, and you want to get a clear sense about where they're at. And if there's so much ambiguity, you don't know which of these tasks they've completed, there's a big uncertainty about where they're at in their in their development process. Any questions on that? Let's be clear. I know you folks probably don't love writing tests. I know in many classes you've been able to avoid writing unit tests. But let's be very clear. If you don't do that here, your other friends in the team are going to suffer because of it. Right? their code won't work because your code is broken. Their code doesn't work well with yours. And uh, if you don't have decent documentation, they're also gonna have trouble with your code. This is not, this is not about making me happy. This is about, and, and getting a good grade. This is about helping your, your, your whole project to survive. And you don't wanna be depending on optimism for that. You wanna be depending on evidence, and evidence in the form of passing tests, evidence in the form of having passed peer review, et cetera. This is not a time to sort of try to play fast and loose. You'll, you'll end up uh, in a bad way with unreliable um, implementations and with a lot more debugging down the road. So, so try to be clear about this and try to have a standard on your project for what it means to be complete, okay? Um, so, you know, going, going into the mid-semester, you're going to be wanting to be very clear about which items have been completed for this given scrum, this given um, uh, sprint, um, the amount of time you spent working on those items, um, how much time have they taken compared to the estimated time, so you can compare the difference. That's very important. You should be doing estimation ahead of time, how long you think it will take, maybe give a range, 
and then you should see how long it actually takes and that will help you give better estimates potentially in the future. You're going to want to have defect counts by prioritization, priority one, two, three, and we'll talk some about what that involves. But basically it takes out the severity and the, the uh, probability of the occurrence, uh, both estimated of course. Um, and have some sense about, okay, when are we done? Um, at what point is a feature likely to, to be left in? And, you know, towards the end of a given scrum, um, knowing something about how many bics, uh, bugs have been fixed, how many have been found, um, um, how many of them are recirculating because uh, you fix something and now it's broken something else. Those are good things to, uh, to be able to, to measure. Okay. Um, so what's expected from here is a specification of your tasks. I want to know what those are. And, uh, and you know, indication of, of which are complete. That will be an uh, important thing for your project manager to know where, where you're at with development. Okay, so um, those were some uh, comments on the, um, the best practices side. Any questions about these? We're going to be looping around and coming back to testing. We're going to talk about bug reports. We're going to be talking about stages in a bug's life cycle. We're going to be talking about some of the um, ways in which um, uh, you classify bugs uh, in the issue, uh, issue tracking systems, etc. But any questions on these things that I've talked about? Questions? Okay. Okay, so let's, let's talk briefly then, and, and we'll have to continue next time, about um, requirements. Okay? Um, so, in fact, I'm tempted to, to stop this, um, but uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll, uh, I'll keep it going here. Okay, so, um, uh, with respect to requirements, ooh, hey, what's going on here? Okay, let me get that up again. Um, uh, requirements elicitation, gathering, eliciting requirements from a, a criteria is a very important part of this class. And, um, you know, basically requirements criteria that has to be satisfied by a successful project. So, you may have heard me ask, a stakeholder, uh, what would, what's your notion of what a successful project would include? What things would a successful project have to be, have to include to be considered a success? That gives you some understanding of what, what the requirements are. Um, uh, and, you know, often it, it's some problem, some gap that, that's uh, solved for the user or something that's derivative from that. Um, Requirements gathering is defined by Jerry Weinberg, who has a wonderful series of, of four books in quality software management, as an attempt to discover what product is desired by people. So people being the stakeholders, typically sometimes end users, we're trying to discover what they're seeking, what they will view as a success, what they would view as, 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 a, um, as an adequate delivery. Um, so why talk about something so basic? Well. It, it turns out that requirements gathering is, is, is really, really important, and it's hard. Um, and, you know, I'll try to provide, and it's not going to all happen this afternoon, we'll have to uh, continue some on Thursday, to provide some tips to do it more reliably and um, uh, make sure to, to avoid requirements falling through the cracks, okay? Um, so. Requirements are given as the number one or number two reason for runaway projects. By pro one or two projects, I mean projects that take far more time than is expected and that are often canceled. And there's a long history in software of runaway projects being a you know, major, major feature of the industry. Um, and look, if you don't know where you're going, it's hard to get there. Um, so. You know, you need some understanding of what customers want to deliver it successfully. If, if you don't have that understanding, at the least it will often take longer to, to, to get there. And uh, it turns out that, that if you can not nip things in the bud in the requirements phase, misunderstanding is far cheaper. Why is this? If we were to draw out cost for fixing a problem, depending on 
maybe it's a requirements problem, and we end up identifying identifying this misunderstanding with the stakeholder later and later in the project. So this is time and often sort of phase of work with, with the project. Um, how do you think this, this changes over time? So this is cost for fixing. Maybe it's dollars, maybe it's hours needed to fix. How do you think that changes? Exponential. It is exponential. It's not merely linear. It doesn't go up and saturate. It often goes up exponentially, at least to a certain point. Why is that? What happens? Think concretely about it. If you could catch this in the requirements phase, in the very first phase, versus later on, what's happening that accounts for this larger and larger cost? More code you have to rewrite. Yeah. More design specs you have to rewrite, you know, design plans, more code. What else besides code, though? What else goes with code? People. Testing. Testing. You have to throw away a lot of tests sometimes. There's people involved in, in doing all this work. A lot of testing that went into testing the old understood requirement now has to be redone with respect to the new requirement. And then once you get into field deployment, I mean, it can be especially painful. I mean, if you have a um, app out there, like uh, point um, um, up on um, uh, 43rd Street area, um, uh, uh, the, the the International Road Dynamics um, company. They do um, highway side boxes across the world that are deployed with firmware. And if there's a problem in the firmware, um, traditionally someone had to go there physically and find the box and update the firmware in person. Uh, a lot of embedded systems are around. Think about uh, the computers in your car that you know, need to be brought in for service and to have their, their firmware updated. Um, it gets, for certain types of systems particularly, it gets very painful to update it in the field. For others, it's less so, you know, rolling out a new version of an app or what have you. But even there, this new version of the app might introduce incompatibility issues with the earlier version of the website or what have you. And it can be, it can be a real problem. So, you know, depending on what phase it's, it's found, requirements, design, coding, development, testing, etc. Often the costs can go up um, hugely and it, it listed down there. Um, so turns out that if you're clear about requirements, if you're really clear about what they involve, it's much easier to build a system. A lot of the churn, a lot of the, the time lost is due to lack of clarity about requirements. And you know they've done control tests and found orders of magnitude decrease the amount of work if you are clear, if you have really well specified requirements compared to if you're just feeling it out over time by interaction with the stakeholder. Okay, um, And it turns out from a systems perspective, this is kind of a causal loop diagram type structure for those who are familiar with that, um, that it turns out requirements process um, quality um, ends up impacting all three elements of the iron triangle. Does anyone does anyone know the definition of the iron triangle? I'll draw a triangle up here. This is the iron triangle. Okay. Um, anyone know what's on three edges of the iron triangle? The three vertices. You haven't heard this before, other classes? Okay, so the other triangle is talking about the fact that a software project, product, often has to navigate three difficult constraints, okay? One is dollars, the amount of dollars to develop it. One is time, the amount of time to develop it. And the other is, variously, scope or quality. Okay, scope slash quality. Basically, how much value does it offer to the user? And the idea here, ladies and gentlemen, mark my words. This often ends up in exams. The idea is it's easy to get two out of three. It's often hard to get three out of three. To minimize dollars, time, and maximize quality is tough. Pick two, 
you know, given enough time, you could do things often for less dollars and with decent quality. If you don't care about quality, you could, do, you could produce things really quickly and cheaply. Uh, it's not going to offer much value. If you're not concerned about dollars, you can pay top dollar for really, really good developers. Crack development teams who know the requisite technologies in and out, you can often do it in less time and with high quality. But getting all three, uh, that's the rub. It's hard. It's hard. Can you understand that? That makes sense? Iron triangle is often a very re a, you know, real, real prominent part of, of effective development. It's, um, it, it forces us you know, to realize that we're operating within some pretty tight constraints and, and forces us to, to watch all three angles over time as the process evolves. And it turns out, and mark my words again, the requirements process, doing requirements well helps all three. It can help identify faults early on, if you really are careful, identify misunderstandings with the team, um, and it can therefore help lower the cost and lower the, lower the time required. It can help better, better match up with, uh, with what, the, what the customer needs, therefore help enhance product quality. Um, and also it can aid development effectiveness, help them spend their time more effectively instead of throwing away code, throwing away requirements, throwing away design specs, throwing away tests that's required when there's a misunderstanding. And that helps all three of these. So there are some, some things that can help these. We're, we often are operating within tight constraints here, but, um, but there are things that we can do in terms of putting investments and in requirements that will, will help on all three vertices. Okay, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk about this uh, more, but uh, time is short, so I'll just uh, leave the slides in there. So what are some problems that might come up with a uh, requirement statement? So you want to gather some requirements, and you go and you talk to a stakeholder. Um, and you come away with a list. What can go wrong? Give me a few things. You forget something? You forgot something. You leave something out. Good. They are expecting more than what you can do in the time. OK, so unrealistic sort of uh, expectations on their part. Uh, OK. Um, so maybe the what's down on the list is impractical. How about something else as well? Yeah. Misunderstandings. Misunderstandings. They said one thing. You thought they meant something else. Maybe they were using, maybe you know the person you're speaking to is a doctor, and they use some words you didn't fully know what they meant, but you think you you got the gist of it, but you're not really sure. You're not really sure because they're describing something in their environment that you've never seen directly. Other things. Conflicting requirements. Conflicting requirements. Could there be two stakeholders who say somewhat different things about what's important? Can you imagine that? Maybe from within the same organization? Happens all the time. Same organization, two different perspectives on things. One says, you know, for me, what's really important is this. Another one says, no, these other things. Other things that could go wrong? That's well, pretty good. That's pretty good, the, the set you've mentioned. So there can be ambiguity, uh, implicit assumptions, incompleteness, conflict between different people, um, di and different priorities associated with this. Um, um, there can be a lack of clarity about what are the relative prioritizations. Uh, that that true. Sometimes developers insert their own requirements. They think, wouldn't it be cool if we did that? You know, they've asked that, man, that would be cool. We could, we could do this other thing and, and uh, try to get that in there. Um, people forget what the stakeholder said. You don't remember it, it clearly. Maybe it wasn't recorded or what have you. Maybe it was just one person and that person uh, forgets. Um, or maybe it's too specific, it ties you down. The other thing is, there's a lot of requirements that aren't given directly by the user. They're what we call derived requirements. These are requirements that are implied at some level, um, but, but the user doesn't request them, maybe because they don't know they're implied. Um, so you know, uh, because your system has to run on mobile devices, 
it needs to have a smaller memory footprint um, and low power consumption. The user doesn't care about that. All they want is an app that will give them you know, good performance, nice functionality, and won't drain their battery too much. And you know, in order to achieve that, you need to have certain technical features of it. You, there's some management in terms of wake locks, in terms of keeping the power consumption low, and, in terms of uh, the amount of memory it has to install. Um, so, you know, maybe the user wants to run certain algorithms within a certain, um, s with a certain speed for it to be useful to them in real time. And because of that, you know that, um, you know, it needs to make use of GPUs, and you know the GPU languages uh, these days are mostly C libraries. And so you need to write your application in, in using those C libraries. And that's not the, something the user cares about directly, but it's implied by, by their needs using existing technologies, right? Um, because, because you want to use uh, you know, certain libraries, maybe it's uh, collaborative software libraries, um, maybe it needs to run in JavaScript uh, through a browser, for example, um, to get those operational transformation capabilities. Um, uh, so for you know, many, many reasons about this, but fundamentally, there are certain things the user says they want that imply other things that they don't explicitly care about, but are implied. Because often it's their request together with the state of the technologies. The only way you can be able to do this is by this technology and that technology only runs under these circumstances. With low memory footprints, with C libraries or whatever. And so there you're stuck with the requirement that they didn't explicitly talk about, mention, but is, it extends from what they want. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of what we're doing when we engage with requirements is identifying derived requirements too. It's not just what they say, but it's what the, what is implied by what they say together with technologies. Okay. Okay. I think we're we're out of time here for today. So I'm going to stop here. We'll finish up with some um, tips on the uh, requirements, some examples of requirement statements here, folks, for you to look at, and um, some talk about other types of requirements and a bunch of tips for you when you're talking with your stakeholders, okay?